Chapter 11 of How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How It Flies, or Conquest of the Air, by Richard Ferris. Chapter 11. Model Flying Machines. It is related of Benjamin Franklin that when he went out with his famous kite with the wire string, trying to collect electricity from the thundercloud, he took a boy along to forestall the ridicule that he knew would be meted out to him if he openly flew the kite himself. Other scientific experimenters, notably those working upon the problem of human flight in our own time, have encountered a similar condition of the public mind, and have chosen to conduct their trials in secret, rather than to contend with the derision, criticism, and loss of reputation which a skeptical world would have been quick to heap upon them. But such a complete revolution of thought has been experienced in these latter days that groups of notable scientific men gravely flying kites, or experimenting with carefully made models of flying machines, arouse only the deepest interest, and their smallest discoveries are eagerly seized upon by the daily press as news of the first importance. So much remains to be learned in the field of aeronautics that no builder and flyer of the little model aeroplanes can fail to gain valuable information if that is his intention. On the other hand, if it be the sport of racing these model aeroplanes which appeals to him, the instruction given in the pages following will be equally useful. The earnest student of aviation is reminded that the progressive work in this new art of flying is not being done altogether, nor even in large part, by the daring operators who, with superb courage, are performing such remarkable feats with the flying machines of the present moment. Not one of them would claim that his machine is all that could be desired. On the contrary, these intrepid men more than any others are fully aware of the many and serious defects of the apparatus they use for lack of better. The scientific student in his workshop, patiently experimenting with his models, and working to prove or disprove untested theories, is doubtless doing an invaluable part in bringing about the sort of flying which will be more truly profitable to humanity in general, though less spectacular. One of the greatest needs of the present machines is an automatic balancer which shall supersede the concentrated attention which the operator is now compelled to exercise in order to keep his machine right side up. The discovery of the principle upon which such a balancer must be built is undoubtedly within the reach of the builder and flyer of models. It has been asserted by an eminent scientific experimenter in things aeronautic that we cannot hope to make a sensitive apparatus quick enough to take advantage of the rising currents of the air, etc. With due respect to the publicly expressed opinion of this investigator, it is well to reassure ourselves against so pessimistic an outlook by remembering that the construction of just such supersensitive apparatus is a task to which man has frequently applied his intellectual powers with signal success. Witness the photomicroscope, which records faithfully an enlarged view of objects too minute to be even visible to the human eye. The aneroid barometer, so sensitive that it will indicate the difference in level between the table and the floor. The thermostat, which regulates the temperature of the water flowing in the domestic heating system with a delicacy impossible to the most highly constituted human organism. The seismograph, detecting, recording, and almost locating earth tremors originating thousands of miles away the automatic fire sprinkler, the safety valve, the recording thermometer, and other meteorological instruments, and last, if not of least importance, the common alarm clock. And these are but a few of the contrivances with which man does by blind mechanism that which is impossible to his sentient determination. Even if the nervous system could be schooled into endurance of the wear and tear of consciously balancing an aeroplane for many hours, it is still imperative that the task be not left to the exertion of human wits, but controlled by self-acting devices, responding instantly to unforeseen conditions as they occur. Some of the problems of which the model builder may find the solution are whether large screws revolving slowly, or small screws revolving rapidly, are the more effective. How many blades a propeller should have, and their most effective shape? What is the perfect material for the planes? Maxim found that with a smooth wooden plane he could lift two and a half times the weight that could be lifted with the best made fabric-covered plane. Whether the center of gravity of the aeroplane should be above or below the center of lift, or should coincide with it. New formulas for the correct expression of the lift in terms of velocity and angle of inclination. The former formulas having been proved erroneous by actual experience. How to take the best advantage of the tangential force announced by Lilienthal, and reasserted by Hargrave, and many others. And there is always the paradox airplane to be explained. 
and when explained it will be no longer a paradox but will doubtless open the way to the most surprising advance in the art of flying it is not assumed that every reader of this chapter will become a studious experimenter but it is unquestionably true that every model builder in his effort to produce winning machines will be more than likely to discover some fact of value in the progress making toward the ultimate establishment of the commercial navigation of the air the tools and materials requisite for the building of model airplanes are few and inexpensive for the tools a small hammer a small iron block plane a fine cut half round file a pair of round nose pliers three twist drills as used for drilling metals the largest one sixteenth inch diameter and two smaller sizes with an adjustable brad awl handle to hold them a sharp pocket knife and if practicable a small hand vise the vise may be dispensed with and common brad awls may take the place of the drills if necessary for the first described model the simplest the following materials are needed some thin white wood one sixteenth inch thick as prepared for fret sawing some spruce sticks one quarter inch square skyrocket sticks are good a sheet of heavy glazed paper a bottle of liquid glue some of the smallest in diameter brass screws one quarter to one half inch long some brass wire one twentieth inch in diameter one hundred inches of square rubber elastic cord such as is used on return balls but one sixteenth inch square and a few strips of draughtsman's tracing cloth as the propeller is the most difficult part to make it is best to begin with it the flat blank is cut out of the white wood and subjected to the action of steam issuing from the spout of an actively boiling tea kettle the steam must be hot mere vapor will not do the work when the strip has become pliable the shaping is done by slowly bending and twisting at the same time perhaps coaxing would be the better word for it must be done gently and with patience and the steam must be playing on the wood all the time first on one side of the strip then on the other at the point where the fibers are being bent the utmost care should be taken to have the two blades bent exactly alike although of course with a contrary twist the one to the right and the other to the left on each side of the center a lead pencil line across each blade at exactly the same distance from the center will serve to fix accurately the center of the bend if two blocks are made with slots cut at the angle of one inch rise to two and a quarter inches base and nailed to the top of the workbench just far enough apart to allow the tips of the screw to be slid into the slots the drying in perfect shape will be facilitated the center may be held to a true upright by two other blocks one on each side of the center some strips of white wood may be so rigid that the steam will not make them sufficiently supple in this case it may be necessary to dip them bodily into the boiling water or even to leave them immersed for a few minutes afterward bending them in the hot steam but a wetted stick requires longer to dry and set in the screw shape when the propeller is thoroughly dry and set in proper form it should be worked into the finished shape with the half round file according to the several sections shown beside the elevation for each part of the blade the two strengthening pieces are then to be glued on at the center of the screw and when thoroughly dry worked down smoothly to shape when all is dry and hard it should be smoothed with the finest emery cloth and given a coat of shellac varnish which in turn may be rubbed to a polish with rotten stone and oil it may be remarked in passing that this is a crude method of making a propeller and the result cannot be very good it is given here because it is the easiest way and the propeller will work a much better way is described further on and the better the propeller the better any model will fly but for a novice no time will be lost in making this one for the experience gained will enable the model builder to do better work with the second one than he could do without it for the aeroplane body we get out a straight spar of spruce one quarter inch square and fifteen and a half inches long at the front end of this on the upper side is to be glued a small triangular piece of wood to serve as a support for the forward or steering plane tilting it up at the front edge at the angle represented by a rise of one in eight this block should be shaped on its upper side to fit the curve of the underside of the steering plane which will be screwed to it the steering plane is cut according to plan out of one sixteenth inch white wood planed down gradually to be at the ends about half that thickness this plane is to be steamed and bent to a curve fore and aft as shown in the sectional view the steam should play on the convex side of the bend while it is being shaped to hold it in proper form until it is set blocks with curved slots may be used 
or it may be bound with thread to a molding block of equal length formed to the proper curve. When thoroughly dry, it is to be smoothed with the emery cloth, and a strip of tracing cloth, glossy faiths out, is to be glued across each end to prevent breaking in case of a fall. It is then to be varnished with shellac and polished as directed for the propeller. Indeed, it should be said once for all that every part of the model should be as glossy as it is possible to make it without adding to the weight, and that all entering edges, those which push into and divide the air when in flight, should be as sharp as is practicable with the material used. The steering plane is to be fastened in place by a single screw long enough to pierce the plane and the supporting block and enter the spar. The hole for this screw, as for all screws used, should be drilled carefully to avoid the least splitting of the wood and just large enough to have the screw bite without forcing its way in. This screw which holds the plane is to be screwed home but not too tight so that in case the flying model should strike upon it in falling, the slender plane will swivel and not break. It will be noticed that while this screw passes through the center of the plane sideways, it is nearer to the forward edge than to the rear edge. If the work has been accurate, the plane will balance if the spar is supported, upon the finger, perhaps, as that is sensitive to any tendency to tipping. If either wing is too heavy, restore the balance by filing a little from the tip of that wing. The main planes are next to be made. The lower deck of the biplane is of the 1 inch whitewood, and the upper one is of the glazed paper upon a skeleton framework of wood. The upright walls are of paper. The wooden deck is to be bent into the proper curve with the aid of steam, and when dry and set in form is to be finished and polished. The frame for the upper deck is made of the thin whitewood, and is held to its position by two diagonal struts of whitewood bent at the ends with steam, and two straight upright struts or posts. It is better to bend all cross pieces into the curve of the plane with steam, but they may be worked into the curve on the top side with plane and file, and left flat on the lower side. The drawings show full details of the construction, drawn accurately to scale. It is best to glue all joints, and in addition to insert tiny screws where shown in the plans at the time of gluing. When all the wooden parts are in place, the entire outline of the upper plane and the upright walls is to be formed of silk thread carried from point to point and tied upon very small pins, such as are used in rolls of ribbon at the stores, inserted in the wood. This, the glazed paper is put on double, glossy side out. Cut the pieces twice as large, and a trifle more, than is needed, and fold so that the smooth crease comes to the front and the cut edges come together at the rear. The two inner walls should be put in place first, so as to enclose the thread front and back, and the post between the two leaves of the folded paper. Cutting the paper half an inch too long will give one-fourth of an inch to turn flat top and bottom to fasten to the upper and lower decks, respectively. The two outer walls and the upper deck may be cut all in one piece, the under leaf being slit to pass on either side of the inner walls. A bit of glue here and there will steady the parts to their places. The cut edges at the rear of the deck and walls should be caught together with a thin film of glue so as to enclose the rear threads. When the biplane is completed, it is to be fastened securely to the spar in such a position that it is accurately balanced from side to side. The spar may be laid on a table, and the biplane placed across it in its approximate position. Then move the plane to one side until it tips down, and mark the spot on the rear edge of the plane. Repeat this operation toward the other side, and the center between the two marks should be accurately fastened over the center line of the spar. Even with the greatest care there may still be failure to balance exactly, but a little work with a file on the heavy side, or a bit of chewing gum stuck on the lighter side, will remedy the matter. The body of the aeroplane being now built, it is in order to fit it with propelling mechanism. The motive power to whirl the propeller we have already prepared is to be the torsion or twisting strain, in this case the force of untwisting, of India rubber. When several strands of pure rubber cord are twisted up tight, their elasticity tends to untwist them with considerable force. The attachment for the rubber strands at the front end of the spar is a sort of bracket made of the brass wire. The ends of the wire are turned up just a little, and they are set into little holes in the underside of the spar. Where the wire turns downward to form the hook, it is bound tightly to the spar with silk thread. The hook-shaped tip is formed of the loop of the wire doubled upon itself. The rear attachment of the rubber strands is a loop upon the propeller shaft itself. 
As shown in the drawings, this shaft is but a piece of the brass wire. On one end, the rear, an open loop is formed, and into this is slipped the center of the propeller. The short end of the loop is then twisted around the longer shank, very carefully lest the wire cut into and destroy the propeller. Two turns of the wire is enough, and then the tip of the twisted end should be worked down flat with the file, to serve as a bearing for the propeller against the thrust block. This ladder is made of a piece of sheet brass, a bit of printer's brass rule is just the thing, about one-fortieth of an inch thick. It should be a quarter of an inch wide except at the forward end, where it is to be filed to a long point and bent up a trifle to enter the wood of the spar. The rear end is bent down, not too sharply, lest it break, to form the bearing for the propeller, a hole being drilled through it for the propeller shaft, just large enough for the shaft to turn freely in it. Another smaller hole is to be drilled for a little screw to enter the rear end of the spar. Next pass the straight end of the propeller shaft through the hole drilled for it, and with the pliers form a round hook for the rear attachment of the rubber strands. Screw the brass bearing into place, and for additional strength, wind a binding of silk thread around it and the spar. Tie the ends of the rubber cord together, divide it into ten even strands, and pass the loops over the two hooks, and the machine is ready for flight. To wind up the rubber, it will be necessary to turn the propeller in the opposite direction to which it will move when the model is flying. About a hundred turns will be required. After it is wound, hold the machine by the rear end of the spar, letting the propeller press against the hand so it cannot unwind. Raise it slightly above the head, holding the spar level, or inclined upward a little, as experience may dictate, and launch the model by a gentle throw forward. If the work has been well done, it may fly from 150 to 200 feet. Many experiments may be made with this machine. If it flies too high, weight the front end of the spar. If too low, gliding downward from the start, weight the rear end. A bit of chewing gum may be enough to cause it to ride level and make a longer and prettier flight. A very graceful model is that of the monoplane type illustrated in the accompanying reproductions from photographs. The front view shows the little machine just ready to take flight from a table. The view from the rear is a snapshot taken while it was actually flying. This successful model was made by Harold S. Lynn of Stamford, Connecticut. Before discussing the details of construction, let us notice some peculiar features shown by the photographs. The forward plane is arched, that is, the tips of the plane bend slightly downward from the center. On the contrary, the two wings of the rear plane bend slightly upward from the center, making a dihedral angle, as it is called, that is, an angle between two surfaces, as distinguished from an angle between two lines. The toy wheels, Mr. Lynn says, are put on principally for looks, but they are also useful in permitting a start to be made from a table or even from the floor, instead of the usual way of holding the model in the hands and giving it a slight throw to get it started. However, the wheels add to the weight, and the model will not fly quite so far with them as without. The wood from which this model was made was taken from a bamboo fish pole, such as may be bought anywhere for a dime. The pole was split up, and the suitable pieces whittled and planed down to the proper sizes, as given in the plans. In putting the framework of the planes together, it is well to notch very slightly each rib and spar where they cross. Touch the joint with a bit of liquid glue, and wind quickly with a few turns of sewing silk, and tie tightly. This must be done with delicacy, or the frames will be out of true. If the work is done rapidly, the glue will not set until all the ties on the plane are finished. Another way is to touch the joinings with a drop of glue, place the ribs in position on the spars, and lay a board carefully on the work, leaving it there until all is dry, when the tying can be done. In either case, the joinings should be touched again with the liquid glue, and allowed to dry hard. The best material for covering these frames is the thinnest of china silk. If this is too expensive, use the thinnest cambric. But the model will not fly so far with the cambric covering. The material is cut one-fourth of an inch too large on every side, and folded over, and the fold glued down. Care should be taken that the frame is square and true before the covering is glued on. The motive power is produced by twisting up a rubber tubing. Five and three-quarter feet of pure rubber tubing are required. It is tied together with silk so as to form a continuous ring. This is looped over two screw hooks of brass, one in the rear block and the other constituting the shaft. This looped tubing is twisted by turning the propeller backward about 200 turns. 
As it untwists, it turns the propeller, which, in this model, is a traction screw, and pulls the machine after it as it advances through the air. The propeller in this instance is formed from a piece of very thin tin, such as is used for the tops of cans containing condensed milk. Reference to the many illustrations throughout this book showing propellers of flying machines will give one a very good idea of the proper way to bend the blades. The mounting with the glass bead and the two leather washers is shown in detail in the plans. The wheels are taken from a toy wagon, and a pair of tin ears will serve as bearings for the axle. The sport of flying model airplanes has led to the formation of many clubs in this country as well as in Europe. Some of the mechanisms that have been devised, and some of the contrivances to make the models fly better and further, are illustrated in the drawings. Records have been made which seem marvelous when it is considered that 200 feet is a very good flight for a model propelled by rubber. For instance, at the contest of the Birmingham Aero Club, England, in September, one of the contestants won the prize with a flight of 447 feet, lasting 48 seconds. The next best records for duration of flight were 39 seconds and 38 seconds. A model airplane which is guaranteed to fly 1,000 feet, according to the advertisement in an English magazine, is offered for sale at $15. The American record for length of flight is held by Mr. Frank Schober of New York, with a distance of 215 feet 6 inches. His model was of the Langley type of tandem monoplane, and very highly finished. The problem is largely one of adequate power without serious increase of weight. End of chapter 11